there was no archive when I began my research career. And I clearly remember how the introduction of the archive suddenly changed everything. It was now possible to move into a new area of research without being invited to the key conferences or being on the appropriate preprint mailing list. Personally, most valuable to me was the ability to transfer insights from one field to another. I've been working on the dynamics of quantum phase transitions in condensed matter systems for many years. It was by reading the archive that I realized that string theorists had begun to address related questions by very different methods. This led me to initiate collaboration with some string theorists. And when we posted our first paper on the archive on the interface between string theory and condensed matter, I fully expected the paper would be dismissed as a curiosity and would fade into obscurity. But soon more papers appear on the same subject and a new subfield has developed with the boundary between condensed matter and string theory. Many of us have since met at several conferences, but the archive was crucial to the nucleation uh, of this subfield. Marking the one millionth archive submission, here are some introductory slides I've used, starting with this plot of monthly submissions going back to the summer of 1991 when the original email transponder went live. It was intended to level the research playing field, giving equal access to the most recent materials, and designed for about 100 submissions per year in a particular subfield. 23 years later, that rate has scaled up by a factor of 1,000. There are more details of the origin story in this 20th anniversary write-up from a few years ago. This is the HP 735 it was running on in the early days of the web, over 20 years ago, under a desk in my office at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. The main site moved in 2001 and has since been administered and maintained by the Cornell University Library, which has also figured out a way to fund it. Here's a decade-old screen grab of the front page. Perhaps reassuringly, it hasn't changed much. The glass half-full view would be, what prescience to still be using a methodology from decades ago? The glass half-empty view would be, wow, does that site ever need an overhaul? Some of that, of course, has been happening behind the scenes. The plot at left shows the cumulative submissions by subject area. Early on, there were comments that this wouldn't catch on in field X, but some of the early slow starters, for example, condensed matter and astrophysicists, did catch up to the high-energy physicists within a decade. Later mathematics caught on, and most recently, computer science has started to pick up. The experience has been that once a community latches on, it doesn't turn back. It took about 17 years until 2008 for the first half million submissions, then only another six years to double that. At current growth rates, it'll double again to 2 million before 2022. In the early 2000s, we did a reality check to see whether it was still as necessary a resource, with most conventional journals then coming online, and discovered that usage was heavier than ever. From a few hundred thousand full-text downloads per week then, to closing in on a couple million per week now. In the run-up to the one million point, I made this projection based on previous year's data and was intrigued to find that the year-to-year -year statistics are regular enough, with some luck, that a month later it hit the threshold within a few hours of the projection, on the night of the Christmas Day holiday. Those submissions were made available at the beginning of this week, on the 29th of December, and there's been some fun multinational press coverage. Archive is community-supported and collaboratively governed. As we celebrate this important milestone, we would like to thank everyone involved in Archive's operation. Its business model is based on a generous operating grant from the Simons Foundation with additional funds from the Cornell University Library and 180 member libraries and research laboratories from all over the globe. Cornell University Library holds the overall responsibility for the service. The library is advised by two boards composed of international scientists, librarians, and technologists. Scientific Advisory Board provides intellectual oversight with a focus on archives moderation system. Member Advisory Board is composed of elected representatives from archives membership. The group advises the library on various issues such as business planning. Also critical to archive success is over 150 experts worldwide who moderate and classify submissions to verify that they are topical and of interest to the scientific community. The archive is a crucial resource for researchers looking to keep up with material in their field. Whether used as a preprint archive for early access to new research, or in the more traditional sense of an archive for past research, the success of the archive depends on the researcher being able to conveniently locate whatever it is he or she is looking for. The moderation process contributes to this success 
by making sure the reader doesn't have to sort through a lot of material that's irrelevant to them or far outside their area. It also ensures that each manuscript gains maximal exposure by steering it towards the community most interested in reading it. Congratulations to the archive on its millionth article. During the accumulation of the next million, the moderators will continue trying to make sure all articles find their target audience. Archive has always been of, by, and for the scientific research community, and we look forward to supporting science into the future, even as we pause to celebrate this milestone of one million articles on archive. One of my roles as scientific director is to better integrate the archive team working in the Cornell University Library uh, with the advisory boards that help us to formulate policy and with the large number of volunteer moderators who, who work to ensure that submissions are of interest to the research communities that they, they represent. Um, archive has grown from its roots in high energy physics to encompass a wide variety of fields and we would want to continue to work with members of other fields, uh, other research communities who'd like to see their, their work uh, better represented in archive. Uh, finally, we'd like to leverage the expertise of our institutional members and supporters to best position archive moving forward in, in the face of a changing landscape in, in scientific publishing and scholarly communication. Hi, I'm Andy Millis, the Associate Director for Physics at the Simons Foundation. I'm also a practicing theoretical physicist, and I've known about the archive since it was founded in 1991 at Los Alamos. I've watched it grow from that modest beginning into what it is today an indispensable tool used by millions of scientists across field and across the world to communicate their ideas with remarkable power and effectiveness. Here at the Foundation, our mission is to support basic research in math, computer science, and the physical and life sciences. Communication is an essential part of science, and for that reason, we're proud to support the Archive in what it does. So, to the Archive, congratulations on paper number million, and here's to many millions more. It is my privilege to represent the CIC universities, that is, the universities that are members of the Big Ten Conference plus the University of Chicago, on the Management Advisory Board of Archive. Several years ago, when we were asked to consider a new funding model to subsidize Archive through a voluntary annual contribution, we were skeptical. Would it be fair for some to pay while others could be free riders? However, the suggested contribution ranging from $1,500 to $3,000 a year per university was modest when compared to what we typically pay for a serial subscription. The use of archive by faculty and graduate students is phenomenal. In 2014, the number of downloads by researchers at the CIC universities was over 700,000. True, our researchers would have access to archive even without our individual institutional financial commitment since Archive is an open repository and available to the world. However, without the subsidy provided to Archive by universities, Archive would not be sustainable. We thank those universities that have committed support to Archive through an annual contribution. For those that haven't, we ask them to consider doing so, since providing such a wealth of research findings freely to the world is invaluable.